the best man's speech is not supposed to last any longer than the groom is expected to last on his wedding night. Guys, I'm really sorry. Nazari took my notes last night. He was messed with. He actually scratched out the first part of it. Do not leave with this joke. You could get really. Corey, I am so sorry, man. Seriously, it was about two years ago that I suppose uh, I was on vacation with the Millers when uh, Corey made one of the biggest decisions a young man could make. He had been planning this out for some time, and he would even gone out and bought a really nice ring. And here we were on the beaches of Maine, and he had also brought a very, very special person along with him on vacation that, that year. And here we are on these beautiful, just gorgeous beaches of Maine, and, and Corey got down on one knee. And he asked me to be his best man. <laughs> now, I was honored to have been asked at first, so I was without words. But then I saw a tear welling up in Corey's eye. And he said with his lip quivering, Come on, man! Don't leave me hanging out here! So I said, are you, for, are you for real, man? And he said, yes, I'm for real. And so I said, yes. And he stood up and he gave me a hug. <laughs> Moment. Now, Corey also proposed a cookie that day, but, but that's the here today. After I got home from vacation that summer, I immediately began thinking of what I would say when it came time for me to give my toast. And after thinking about it for nearly two years now, I've come to the conclusion that words simply are not sufficient. I mean, I, I really cannot put my thoughts my, and my uh, feelings into words. And so, instead of a, uh, a best man speech like most people would have, I have prepared an interpretive dance. <laughs> instead of a more traditional best man speech. So, ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, I present to you the cookie. So many, so many memories. I'm, I'm really afraid that I, uh, I just can't go on. <laughs> so I've also prepared a written speech. <laughs> For those of you who do not know me by name, by now, my name is Griffin Borges, and you should probably get comfortable. By the way, uh, <laughs> my wife is Ashlyn, Corey's, uh, Corey's uh, sister, and so. Uh, Corey's been, well, kind of like a brother-in-law to me, if you will. <laughs> and I've been given the title of the best man. But I'm really not the best man standing here today. To be honest with you all, I'd have to say that Corey is the real best man. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I am the best man. <laughs> Man. But as for today, I am the best man. And uh, as I said, I'm, uh, I'm married to 
married to Corey's sister. And so I remember one spring afternoon back in 2004, I was calling the Miller's house to speak with uh, Ashlyn. And this is just shortly after I met her. And so uh, the phone rings a number of times. And somebody picks up and says, oh! <laughs> and so uh, I was kind of thrown by the voice a little bit. But, you know, you know, politely I asked, is Ashlyn there? And the voice says, I believe so! You must be Griffin! My Lord speaks very highly of you! <laughs> now, judging by the high-pitched voice, I figure this has got to be Ashlyn's mom. But you see, there's this strange, crackly, and even a raspy hint to the voice. So I figured, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe she's a smoker. I don't know. So, I responded, yes, Mrs. Miller, I, I am Griffin. And uh, the voice cracked back, Mrs. Miller! I'm Ashlyn's father, King! And I don't want to be being called a man! So quickly I apologized. And then there was a sudden awkward silence that fell over the phone lines. And then I heard a little snickering on the other end of the line as the raspy tone left the voice and it responded. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, man! This is Corey! I'm Ashlyn's brother! Nice to meet you, man! <laughs> Corey was about 13 years old. That explained the high-pitched voice. And the raspy undertones was his sad attempt at a deep male voice. I laughed, although not thoroughly impressed with his joke. I did like the spirit of it. But nobody pulls a joke on the master of practical jokes and gets away with it. So immediately I began plotting my revenge. Some time passed and I figured Corey had probably forgotten about the jab that he had taken at me that begged for a retaliation. So one night, when Corey was in the basement at the Millers watching a movie, Ashlyn and I brought a friend named Caleb over to the Millers house. Now, Corey and Caleb had never met before. And with Caleb weighing in at approximately 300 pounds, we decided to take advantage of the situation. We dressed Caleb up in all dark colors and sent him down the basement steps wearing a ski mask and carrying a plastic pistol. When he got to the bottom of the steps and saw Corey, he turned around and ran back up the steps yelling, They're home! Everybody out of the house now! After Caleb ran out of the garage, there was about an eight second delay before Corey raced to the top of the steps, looking as though he had just seen a ghost. <laughs> Ashlyn and I couldn't stop laughing, but Corey didn't find the humor in the situation. <laughs> now, eventually, Corey did get over it, and after realizing his practical joke skills were, well, lacking in comparison to mine, he pleaded with me for some sort of a truce. And so after uh, a little bit of negotiating, mostly on the uh, topics of uh, wages, benefits, and a retirement plan, the two of us teamed up and we quickly became friends. We would drive all around town together, pulling practical jokes on our friends and, yes, even complete strangers. One time we went to a McDonald's and taped a handwritten sign to the drive through menu that said, Speaker, don't work. Speak loud and clear. <laughs> And we sat back and watched as customers would drive up and order a number seven with a Coke and a Mick Flurry. <laughs> we would put fake parking tickets on cars that were parked in objectionable manners and sit sometimes up to an hour to watch the person's reaction. <laughs> One time we drove down the highway and every time we passed another car, I would slow down to that car's speed and Corey would look out the window with a concerned look and hold up a sloppily handwritten sign that said, Is that your cat on the roof? <laughs> Corey and I had some good times together over the years, and I watched him grow from a little kid just hitting puberty into a fine young man who can grow a thicker, nicer beard than I can. I watched him go from a man who worshipped regularly at the Bedside Baptist with Reverend Sheets to becoming a strong man of God, full of integrity. I have never known a more trustworthy young man in all my life, and he has proven himself to be the best friend I could ever ask for. Corey and I live about four hours apart. 
but I'm closer to him and know more about him than many of my friends who live just a few miles up the road. Corey is one of the truly rare friends I have found in life, who I can call at 4 o'clock in the morning if I need somebody to talk to. He'll pick up the phone, and he won't get upset. Of course, he might not be completely awake, and he might not remember a thing I told him come the morning, but he won't get upset. You know, in life, I hear a lot of people say that you have friends and family. And some people even go as far as to call their closest friends family. But to me, that's a little backwards. I mean, everybody has a family, but not everybody's close to their family. And some people find their families to be more of an obligation than a sense of joy. But, you know, I, I'm one of the fortunate ones. I've had a wonderful family, and back in 2008, when I married my beautiful wife, Ashlyn, my family grew and like doubled in size. And I was overjoyed to finally have a younger brother. But to me, Corey isn't just family. Corey's a friend. Corey's the kind of friend that the scriptures talk about, the friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I've known Corey for a long time now. And uh, he's, he's, like I said, he's proven himself to be just an amazing guy. He's, he's a great kid who can just light up a room with his smile. You know, a smile that's worth a million bucks. But Cookie, I can honestly say that as long as I have known Corey, I never have seen him happier than when he's with you. And I, and I know there's not a single person in the world that he'd rather spend his time around and be with than you. Well, except for you, of course. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I don't want to bore you much longer, so I'll get right down to the heart of my speech. Corey, would you uh, take, Cookie, would you take your hand and place it on the table? And Corey, take your hand and place it on top of this. And look at her in the eye, Corey. I want you to remember this Corey moment. Yeah, this moment, Corey. <laughs> I'm a professional public speaker, folks. <laughs> remember this moment, Corey. Remember and cherish it. Because I can tell you with experience, this is the last time you'll ever have the upper hand. <laughs> amazing girl to spend the rest of your life with. Um, I'm just so happy for the two of you. Corey, at the risk of sounding gay, I love your brother. Uh, 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 Corey, just don't mess it up, man. Always remember uh, the advice that Danielle just shelled out that, that came from Adam. Happy wife, happy life. Thank you very much, everyone. show that I have been running my mouth for about 13 to 14 minutes now. You have some living up to do, my friend. Good luck. <laughs>